right, what's up, everybody? Hey, as everybody's crashing in here, it's going to be awesome. Please don't sit too far away. It's the 9 o'clock on a sunny day, but hey, let's pray. Father, we just lift up today's services. Lord, we just thank you that you're here. God, thank you that you're going to move in a mighty way. God, we just pray, Lord, that today is fun and awesome and memorable. And Lord, thank you that you've already won. Thanks for everybody that's here. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, you guys can stand up. We're going to get it on. Shame to say so. I see the Jesus way, and I'm walking in the light. Oh, we sing it out this morning. And I see the world in light. I see the world in wonder. I see the world in life bursting in living color. I see the world you way, and I'm walking in the light. So say, I see the world in love, I see the world in freedom, I see the Jesus way, in the wonder in the wild, Jesus, wonder in the
this valley you go before me and I can see it the land you promised unto me lost and hope is gone you take my hand you're holding on you are faithful you are faithful through it all oh. and Jesus This mountain glory comes in like a flood. Let's 
So I noticed today, uh, just seeing some of the guys that are here today, I feel like there's some people that are hungry for God in here today. And I know there's some people in here today that are seeking after God. I just want to say I'm so glad you're here. And I know worship is a weird experience for you because we're singing to God. And and you you may not be there yet, but if you really knew how far we've come, so many of us, so many people in here, we, we, we were really messed up before Jesus. And so today, um, if you're here and you're seeking God, just realize it's kind of weird when people get personal with Jesus. But it's okay. It's a place for you to go after God with all your heart. And so as we sing this song, as we dive into this, I just want to say, would, can we just take a second? Can we just pray? Can we just lift up the people next to you? God, we just... We don't want to just do church here today, Lord. We want to experience you, God. We don't want to just worship God. We want you to encounter us today, Jesus. Father, I just feel in this room, God, that there are people that are hungry for you and they don't know if you're real. So, Father, today, we just invite you. You don't care about the outside. You're after our inside, God. So do something beautiful right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Your name is alive, the shadows can't deny. 
The crowds cursed your name. Heaven's eyes turned away. Still you thought of me. I know. death couldn't keep all your love from me. And you died so that I could have life. There's no still the same beginning and forever sing of all your passion love for me sing of what your love has done me oh, we sing it out we sing it out love is still
the mark, knowing we miss perfection, God. But you've come and you've found us in this place. Whatever we've done today, in our days before, the days to come, God, I pray that you continually meet us. You just come to where we are. Wrap your arms around us. Let us know that even though we've missed the mark, you've come. You've bled on a cross for us. You've taken all of our sins away. So this is like the least favorite thing that I like to do personally, which is the offering. Anybody excited about the offering? And then the rest of the people are like, that church, all they want is my money. Um, I want to read you this verse, Proverbs 21, 26. It says, all day long he craves for more. All day long he craves for more. I, I relate to that. We all crave for more. We crave for more. There's always more to be gotten. There's more to be gotten. But we know that when the Bible says there's a but, that's really anything after the but is important. It says, but the righteous give without sparing. All day long he craves for more, but the righteous give without sparing. Today I'm going to ask you to to give an offering to our church. And I want to start off by saying this. Last month was one of the worst months we ever had. When I found out how bad it was, I almost fell out of my chair. And I know you see this big building. I know you see all this stuff. And I know you see all the people that come. But let me tell you, um, not maybe not at the night, but uh, let me tell you, like, uh, beyond all of that, um, we need your help. We need your support. We need your link arms with us. We're not done yet. We're starting a church in Chelan, regardless of if you give or not. We are going to build out the kids' area regardless of if you give or not. We're going to fix our parking problem because last night the parking was so jacked up, people had to turn around and leave. And so I'm going to pray right now, but I'm just going to ask, let God speak to you. If God is speaking to you to give, be exactly like what it says, but the righteous give without sparing. Father, we just lift up the offering. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everybody that's here today. Lord, I thank you that you have a plan and a vision for us, God. And I just ask that we all join arms together. And whatever enemy plan, any any plan the enemy has of our lives, God, we just pray in the name of Jesus that it's destroyed. Any worry that we have over finances, Lord, the Bible says you are enough, not we are enough. So God, we just give these things to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So offering from the your left to our your right, whatever. Hey, and before we get going, and I, uh, I want to say this: today is a dream. Um, I have the privilege of announcing that Joe from Mosaic LA, actually Mosaic Hollywood, LA, is speaking tonight. So we're gonna have a little video, but when the video's done. We need to raise the roof in this place. Are you guys all in? Hold on. Are you guys all in? Come on. Joe is here. Come on. This is going to be awesome. Come on.
Come on, you guys ready? So check out this video, and then when Joe gets up, make him blush, which would be really hard. <laughs> Welcome to Awaken, and thank you for joining us this weekend. If you're new here today, go ahead and fill out a communication card. We'd love to get to know you better. If you're in middle school or high school, or know someone who's in middle school or high school, pay attention. Awaken's youth camp, Hooked, is coming on July 29th through August 2nd. For more details and information, check out the link below. And if you want to donate food to the youth camp, go to perfectpotluck.com. Our Kids Camp VBS is coming up August 7th through 9th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Lunch is provided. For more info, go ahead and check out the children's check-in area after service. If you have any fussy kids during the service, just take them on back to the kids area. There's going to be plenty for them to do, and they're going to have a service of their own. Well, that's all for announcements for this weekend. Make sure you silence your cell phones, enjoy this service, and check out this video. Step one, push the button, all right? We're going we're gonna to talk about some things. Uh, but, Matt, what an honor to be here. Uh, you guys are incredible, so friendly and kind. Uh, wow, you're just amazing. That video, like, I love the applause part. That was awesome. In case you need to, so there's going to be moments when you need applause, you need to laugh, and it'll be on the screen there. Or you can just follow my wife's lead right there. But, um, yeah, I'm just so, so happy to be here. It's been a, it's been a, Crazy couple days uh, for us. Uh, me and my wife, my wife said, babe, can you raise your hand, stand up? Do some, this is my wife, Rebecca. Can you guys welcome her? That's, that's my ride or die right there, right? Hopefully more ride than die, but she's amazing. Uh, and so we've been in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho for the last few days. Uh, a friend of ours got married, so we were there celebrating them. And you ever, you ever had just like a crazy like 48 hours in your life? Make some noise if you've, you've been there before, right? So I know I have. We, we kind of had that. And so we planned this trip and going to this wedding, and then we're going to go to Seattle afterwards. Uh, then we uh, connected with, uh, with Pastor Falake and Pastor Daniel, and, uh, and we're like, man, we had met them uh, a few months ago in L.A. and just became like just friends instantly and just loved their heart. So we realized we were going to be in the area, and so we set up a thing like, hey, man, it'd be cool to just connect. And like, yeah, hey, you should come and speak. So like, we're, we're down, we're in. So we rented a car, and that was the whole plan. But, you know, there's some stuff going on in my life where I don't have a license right now. I ain't got time to explain it to you. I don't want to get into the details of why I don't have a license, but I don't. But my wife does. So we're like, cool, babe, we'll, we'll, get, we'll set it up in your name. Great. Well, yesterday, we need to go pick up the car, and we're looking for my wife's wallet that has a license in it. Can't find it anywhere. You ever had that moment where you're like, oh, you, you start freaking out before, like, you need to freak out? Because, like, I know what this means. And we're just hotel room. We're just throwing pillows and, and couches all around trying to find this wallet. And we cannot find it anywhere. And then, you know, it's really hard when, like, whenever you're, like, the other, like, like husbands, fellas, you'll understand this. When is, like, the wife's mistake, right? Because most times it's, it's our mistake, Right? And we're the ones that always mess up. But when, like when she messes up, sometimes inside you're like, finally, not me this time. <laughs> so like if I can be honest, I was part of me. I was like, wow, it was, it was her this time, right? So we're trying to find it. We called the airport. We had a layover in Portland. And of, lo and behold, we, my wife left that wallet right on the counter at a coffee shop. So it's in a safe somewhere in Portland. Really beneficial to us at this moment. So we cannot get a car rental. Well, here's the problem, right? We're supposed to be here this morning. We kind of need a car to get here. So we call. It feels so bad. And let me just tell you, you guys have 
the most amazing pastor that is leading you. I mean, an incredible man, even just in the, so we let him know what's going on. And this brother, last night, after church last night, when you all went home to sleep, he drove three and a half hours to Coeur d'Alene to spend the night, and then to wake up at 4 a.m. to come and pick us up and then drive back here. So we are only here because of Pastor Daniel, so thank you so much, bro. You're incredible. You better be good, Joe. <laughs> For sure. 100%, yeah. Uh, and so, man, we are tired. We are exhausted. We didn't get home from the hotel until 2.30 last night, but, but I, I have a feeling that there's a reason that we are here today. That, that what I've noticed in my life, whenever there is opposition, you can always know that something is about to happen on the other side. Amen. That God is moving in a powerful way, and I just know that there's something happening in your church. Something happening here at Awaken that is going to awaken this city. That can awaken this, like state of Washington, that can awaken the United States of America, that can awaken the world. And so I'm just praying that today, maybe just maybe, that God could say something to you that could spark in your life, that could literally change your life and the lives around you forever. So I'm going to pray, then we're going to get started, all right? Longest intro of all time. Here we go. God, we just welcome you in this place. We thank you so much. We thank you we got here safe. We thank you for amazing people uh, like Daniel that just uh, they don't send other people when they could. They go themselves. And I pray that that would be our story as well, that we would always be the ones that we don't look to others to step up, but we are the ones that rise up. And you would do a work in us today, God, that would, uh, you would speak, and then we would have the courage to act. We love you and ask the name of your son, Jesus. And all together we said, amen. amen. One more time, all together we said, amen. All right, so I need a little bit of like, Feedback. I just that's how I'm wired, all right? So if I say something that's good, I want you to just say that's good. Even if it's not, even if it's bad, be like, that's good. <laughs> just throw it out there, right? If I if I say a joke that's funny, even if it's not, laugh. My wife will be your cue. Do whatever she does, okay? So so what I want to talk about today is, is I want to have a conversation with one of my favorite pastors in all the scriptures. But I, but I, kind of the title of, of my talk today is Act Like You Mean It. Now, now what, I, what I hope for us today is that we would have a movement together where we would begin to act like we mean it. We would begin to make shifts in our lives. We begin to, to move when we've been stagnant, when, when we need to run, we will, we will sprint. That we would live a life where we act like we mean it. And one of my, my favorite people in all the scriptures is this guy named Jonathan. And, and I love this moment in the scriptures that we're going to go to in 1 Samuel, where you see Jonathan just, he acts not only like he means it, but he acts like a leader. And there's something powerful when, when we do that together, when we, we can change cities and change nations by the way that we act. So go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 14. And we're going to jump around a little bit, but here we go. We'll start in verse 1. It says, one day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, come, Let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migrin. And with him were about 600 men. So to kind of set up the context, what's going on is that you have, you have Israel that's in a fight with the Philistines. But they are just, they're not winning. They're getting, they're like, you ever, like you grow up when your mama whooped you? Anybody like that? I was, right? There it's like their mama was just giving them a whooping. And they were just losing this fight, losing hope. And it says that it was so bad that Saul, who was the king, had 600 men with him. And they were just chilling in a pomegranate tree. Just basically waiting for their death to come. And it says Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, just all of a sudden has something inside of him that begins to rise up. And he's like, I just can't just sit here and do nothing. And it says that he goes... And he does not tell his father. And this is a really important note. Because I have a feeling that way too many of us, we wait for somebody else to tell us what to do when we already know what we should do. And the, the, the most powerful life that you'll live is the one where, where you don't wait for someone else to give you permission to do the thing that you know you need to do. And, and Jonathan is like, something inside of him is like, no, I'm not even going to tell my father, even though he's the king. That I know inside of me I have to go. 
See, the first thing we need to do, if you're going to live a life where you act like you mean it, I'm going to give you five things, right? Is you got to act on your own accord. You need to act on your own accord. That you just move forward with all faith and all fire and say, it doesn't matter if no one else is with me, I know where I need to go. See, we have some amazing friends that are best friends of ours. Uh, Carlos and Soti, they're from Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and we have just literally become familiar with them. And we have holidays together and we go to parties together. And just a few weeks ago, we were at a birthday party with some friends. And, and we have a two-and-a-half-year-old and a, a six-month. Oh, yeah, I didn't even show that. Can you throw that up? There? Oh, our kids are not with us. We're on vacation. Yeah, so these are kids right here. Just two, that's our, to the left there is our son, Isaiah. He's two-and-a-half. And then indigo to the right. Oh, I miss you. I'll see you guys in a couple of days. Oh, I love them, right? Aren't they, so, aren't they so cute? They get it from their mama, for sure. <laughs> so we're at this birthday party, and we have our son Isaiah is in the pool, and, and our friends Carlos and Zulti, their two-year-old Brooklyn is in the pool as well. well. Our son is like a little more timid and scared a little bit, so he has one of the life vests on. So he's good. But Brooklyn's a little more, like, adventurous and loves to live on the edge, so no life vest for him. And he's, and there's steps, kind of like this, on the pool. And he's, Brooklyn's kind of playing next to the steps. And then, and there's about 50 people at this pool party. Everybody's hanging out, we're having a good time. But you, you ever been around people where you're like, there's, there's so many people, you, th you just defer, and you're like, oh, that person's looking for that person, or that person's watching that person. And it was, it was kind of like that. Everybody assumed that someone was watching Brooklyn. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I will never forget this. I just hear at the top of her lungs, I hear, B, B, which is like Brooklyn's nickname, screaming, and it's Brooklyn's mom, Sothi. And as she screams B, I look in the water, and Brooklyn is underwater, like up to here. And he's, and he's no, he can't breathe, and he's like struggling, trying to get up. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Carlos, like Superman himself, hops over like seven people, reaches into the water, snatches Brooklyn out, like holding him up like a proud father, like, I did it. <laughs> and then Brooklyn's just like trying to catch air, and he's good, and everything was, was totally fine. But it was so freaky. You, you ever had a moment where you're like, that could have gone really, really bad? That was one of those, like, I'll never, I'm never going to go to a pool again with my son and not think about that. See, I love what Carlos did in that moment. That rather than wait for somebody else to jump in and get us, he said, it doesn't matter, I'll be the one that's going to reach in and grab him out. That he had the courage and he had the faith to say, I will be the one regardless of if anyone else will. See, if you're going to live a life where you act like you mean it, you have to learn the discipline of acting on your own accord. Of not waiting for someone to tell you. See, here's the danger here, right? You have amazing people like, like Pastor Daniel that are, are going to cast vision and are going to try and propel you forward. But if you simply wait for him to tell you what to do, you will always live in the past. But, but if you hear his, his words and you, and, you, and you hear him speaking to your soul and you go, I know what he's calling out from inside of me and I need to rise up. If you do it on your own, the speed in which you run will be far greater than if you wait for him to tell you what to do. It's that we have to be the ones where, where we act on our own accord. And Jonathan was standing there and he said, I know what I have to do. That I know that God has already spoken it, but now I need to be the one that steps into it. So you need to be careful because you may live a life where you're always waiting for God to show up. And you're not going to realize that he's waiting for you to step up. See, I think far too often we live lives where we act like, God, where are you? God, how, how come you didn't show up in my marriage? God, how come you haven't shown up in my job? How come you haven't showed up in school? God, how come you haven't showed up in this situation? I feel like you're nowhere to be found. And God's like, why will you not show up? And God's like, I already showed up. When are you going to step up? And he's waiting for us. See, God is looking for women and men that will have the courage that when everyone else is sitting under a pomegranate tree, you will charge into the middle of the fight. Yeah, if one person claps, we all clap. That's the rule. And I love that Jonathan just couldn't wait. And here, keep going. Check what happens next. Verse 6. It says, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, 
Let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Amen, right? He said amen. Like, but, but isn't this one of the most, one of the worst pregame speeches of all time? Here's what Jonathan says to his armor bearer. He says, look, bro, here, here's what's going on. Everybody else is chilling, doing nothing, sitting in a pomegranate tree. Come with me. We got to go fight. And his armor bearer, you can imagine, he's like, yeah, let's do this. Well, what's going to, did God speak to you? Did God tell you we're going to have victory? He said, yeah, no, here's what's going to happen. Maybe God will show up. Maybe he won't. That's the worst pregame speech of all time. Like, you, he's supposed to enlist faith and go, yeah, I know God said it. I know God is going to do this because the heavens opened up and God said, move. See, I think we paralyze ourselves so often because we stand there waiting for that. God, tell me and I'll go. And God says, maybe I'll show up. Maybe I won't. But one thing I know is true is that God never shows up in a place that we don't go to. So I think God is just waiting for us to be like Jonathan to go, actually, I don't know if this is going to work out. We live such safe lives when we know God. And we defer to God because then if God does it, then it removes all the like mystery and uncertainty. What I found to be so true in my life, the most powerful moments in my life were never the moments that were filled with certainty. They were the ones that were the most uncertain. And it forced me to press in and to step in. See, certainty is the death of adventure. And God is the God that is always calling us to adventure. See, not only do we need to act on our own accord, but you need to learn how to act in the midst of uncertainty. That it's so easy, right? It's so much easier to move when you know how it's going to end. But then it doesn't require any amount of faith or trust or belief that God will show up. But, but when, when we act in the midst of the uncertainty, when it's cloudy, when we don't know, when, when, when we're going to build this kid's area and fix his care, regardless of where the money comes from, I love that amount of faith. I love that amount of, like, do you understand what he's saying? He's like, God is going to move. God is going to, like, show up. That's never the question. What Pastor Daniel is trying to invite you to do is, is to actually have you be a part of it. And it's so much more powerful and beautiful when, when God brings a people together and we do it as a unit rather than as an individual. And, you, and we got to learn how to, how to act in the midst of uncertainty and all of our fears, right? Anybody afraid out there? Make some noise if that's you. Yeah. Right? Oh, we all are, right? Fear is just a part of life. And... And here's the thing, right, about uncertainty. Un un uncertainty will, will either fuel your fears or it will ignite your faith. See, I'll say it one more time. Here's the, I love, this is why I love uncertainty. Because the material of it, here's what it creates. Uncertainty will either fuel your fears or it will ignite your faith. And that it's the, it's the context where God goes, See, what I'm going to do in this arena will blow your mind because you'll realize without me it could not have been done. And he, and he pushes us to the place where we are just on the edge of ourselves. And we're like, God, you have to show up. I remember the first time I asked my wife out when before she was my wife, before she was my girlfriend, before she was just a woman from New Zealand that I was like, yo, you look good, girl. <laughs> it was so terrifying, right? Some of the most uncertain things in life is dating. You, you like pull your heart out of your chest and you like let them see it and then you give them the like capacity to throw it on the ground and then step on it. Love is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> and I remember the first time I saw her and I, and I, and I feel like it was going great and we had an amazing conversation. We're talking about life and, and she's from New Zealand. I was like, I love Lord of the Rings and, and Hobbits and yeah, you look amazing. <laughs> and I feel like we were, we were jiving and then and then at that moment came, I was like, yeah, I feel like this, hey, look, let me, like, take you out. It'll be, you know, I'll show you a good time, pick you up, take you where you need to go. She's like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I was like, well, excuse me? She's like, no, nah, I'm good. 
Like, we, we just spent, like, the last hour, like, I feel like we were connecting. I feel like, am I reading this wrong? And later on, right, because you know how the story ends. We got married. We got two kids, right? So, you know, it worked. So, I'm like, what happened? She's like, oh, I was playing hard to get. It's like, ladies, come on. Can you help us? It's, it's scary enough that we try and, like, risk all of our humiliation to ask you out and to be rejected. And then you got to play games, too? Like, just, just keep it real. If you're, if you're feeling him, just let him know, right? That's just that's a free bit of, um, bit of uh, advice there. So she plays hard to get. But I love the fact that, uh, that it worked. Absolutely. Right? The game, keep the game going, obviously. But if it was so much more beautiful that when she said that no, that didn't stop me. It just made me find another way. And I wonder how many times in your life that you've gotten a no and you thought that God shut a door, but he was just waiting for you to keep going. You, you were just waiting for, see, I think there's so many doors that we run into that we think that's God saying, no, you're not supposed to go there. But really it's him saying, where's the sledgehammer? Let's go. Bust the door down. Do whatever it takes. We live such passive lives way too often because we wait for certainty so that we know we'll have success. But God's going, no, I want you to act in the midst of uncertainty and trust that even in that you will still have success. And Jonathan and his armor bearer have this moment where they have no idea if God is going to show up. I love that. I love that they lived in that tension. Before they went into the battle, they did not know if victory was on the other side. All they knew is that even existence was death. And that they had to move forward. They had to keep going. And then 11 verse 7. It says, after the worst pregame speech of all time, the armor bearer looks at Jonathan and he says, Do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I am with you heart and soul. Man, isn't that good? Don't you want like a, a BFF like that? Like we're just, I am with you heart and soul. That even if it costs us our lives, I will go with you. I will fight with you because this has to be done. Someone must act. And if no one else will, even if there's 600 who will do nothing, us too will be the ones who will do something. And they run forward. He says, do all that you have in mind. And I love that he says, I'm with you heart and soul. I love that he didn't say, I'm with you like heart, mind, and soul. He says, a heart and soul. He's like, because my mind actually makes no sense. We're going we're gonna to die, so why would I do that? But he said, I'm with you heart and soul. Because there's something about that, that, that what God is looking for the, is the amazing woman and men that will give him their heart and soul even if their mind isn't there. That even when it doesn't make sense, they'll go, I'm with you heart and soul. So you need to find people in your life that will, will light you on fire. That it is their faith that propels you forward. That, that you see their courage and it gives you courage. And that you don't follow them simply because they help all the dots line up. But you follow them because they pour gasoline on themselves, light themselves on fire, and then pave a way for whatever needs to be done. And we need to be the ones that create a new narrative of what it looks like to be associated with Jesus. Because... It's so sad that for years, decades, generations, the reputation of those that are connected to Jesus is about safety and security, not about fire and passion. Not about doing whatever it takes to change the world, to flip it on its head. See, there was nothing safe and secure about Jesus. When he stepped into, he was, he was human flesh with fire wrapped inside. And he said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to change the human heart, because if I can change the human heart, we can change the world. And he moves forward with so much faith and passion, and he calls us to do the same. And his armor bearer looks at Jonathan, he says, I'm with you, heart and soul. And he says, let's go. And then verse 11, he says, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. 
It's so good, right? They have no idea what's coming. So Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Pause there. I love that moment right there. When Jonathan says, he says, look, God, the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. I love that he didn't say God has given them into our hands. That God has given them into my hands. That Jonathan had this huge vision where he said, no, what this moment here is, this one battle, if we can have victory in this one moment, God has delivered them into the hands of Israel. See, he realized that this was bigger than just himself. He realized that, that there was a bigger story at work. And I wonder for you, what are the victories in your life that you thought were just for you and God said no, it was for us? See, see, what are the things, what are the successes that you've had in your life that you've told yourself, oh, thank you, God, you delivered them into my hands. Now God's like going, no, which and I need you to realize is that that victory was never supposed to be for you. See, we, I think, share in our own victories by ourselves when they're supposed to be a communal experience. Where they're supposed to make us better, not just me better. And he says, I... God, he delivered them into the hand of Israel. And then it said, Jonathan, verse 13, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet. With his armor bearer right behind him, the Philistines fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer followed and killed them. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. So two men go into this fight. They killed 20 men. But I love this moment right here. And it's subtle. But if you catch it in verse 13 at the end, or just read, it says, Jonathan climbed up using his hand and his feet and with his armor bearer right behind him. This is curious, right? I think a lot of times we want to be Jonathan, but first God's like, I need you to be the armor bearer before I can trust you with that. And his armor bearer was behind him. He knew his place. He knew that before you're going to be a leader, you got to know how to follow. And he was behind him. And then it says, the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed him. Okay, the backstory again. With all the Israel, there's only two swords in the entire army. One Saul had, who was with him chilling in that pomegranate tree. The other one was with Jonathan. And he was with his armor bearer, but he was called an armor bearer for a reason. His whole job was to carry Jonathan's armor. He did not have a weapon. He did not have a sword, he did not have a knife, he didn't have a, a rake, he had nothing. He had, he had hands to hold someone else's armor. And when Jonathan went into battle, he would take the armor, here you go, now do what you do, I'm, I'm vulnerable, so I'm probably going to die. But it says that Jonathan went, killed some men, it says his armor bearer followed behind and killed him. How? Was, it, was he a, like, Jedi master? Did he have superpowers? Was he a kung fu where he just he punched people to death? How does his armor bearer kill people if he had no sword? See, I love this moment, right? Because when Jonathan goes first and he kills that first individual, he kills that first soldier, all of a sudden, you know what is at the armor bearer's disposal? His sword. See, when they went into the battle, they only had one sword. But all of a sudden, when they fought and they, just, they killed that first individual, there was another sword that his armor bearer could now fight with. See, this moment is important because you know what we do so often is we wait for God to provide before we act. And what God says is, no, I need you to go into the battle first. I need you to go into the battle with no sword and actually trust that I will provide. See, I just am convinced that there are so many swords available to us but we're, and we've told the story that God doesn't provide. But he's been waiting for us to go into the battle first. He's been waiting for us to trust him. To go, oh, I cannot make sense of this. I don't understand how this will work. I don't understand how, how we don't have the money to make this happen. How can we do this? And he's looking for women and men that do not wait for the check to be written. To have the faith for what it will provide. And we go forward. And I love that, that the provision 
of God did not happen until the activity of man. And I wonder in your life, what are the miracles? What are the blessings? What are the successes that God has been waiting to pour into your life? And he's just waiting for you to get away, get out from under that pomegranate tree, to get up off of the bench, to get from the sidelines and into the game and to say, if no one else will fight, if no one else will act, here am I, God, send me. And I think it's time for us, those of us that have found life in Jesus, those of us who have connected to the living God, it's time for us to act like the women and men we were created to be, to act like the, the fighters and the warriors that go into battle, not knowing if victory is promised, but knowing that something must be done. And it says the... There we go, one person class, we all clap. Well, that's the rule. <laughs> and I love how it ends in verse 22. It says, when all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel and the battle moved on beyond Beth Haven. I love that. The, Fisra the Fisra Philistines were on the run. And it says that those that were hiding followed in hot pursuit. See, I, I just have a feeling that there's people in your life, that there's individuals that God has given you influence over, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's here at church, that, that, are, that are waiting for you to have the courage to act, and that will give them courage to act. See, I know that sometimes we think it's, it's just between me and God, but it's never supposed to be that way. That, that when we move forward, and when we live a life that is filled with faith, we help birth faith in the lives of others. And that there's people in our wake that will run toward the life that they were created to live, run towards making a difference in the world, that will run towards a life filled with joy and wonder if we will be the ones that will go first. And I know that because I'm here. I found life. I'm speaking today because there were people that went before me, that they, had, they saw faith and spoke faith into me before I even saw it, that, that we are our, our energy carriers, that we are, we are people that where, where when we go, we pull people, whether it's to destruction or whether it's to beauty. And it is our responsibility when we have found life in him, not to simply live it for ourselves, but to live it for those that God has put in our lives. And he loved... <laughs> and it says they... Joined in hot pursuit. Because we need to make sure that if we're going to act like we mean it, the last thing is we have to act on behalf of others. We need to understand that it was never supposed to be just about us. That Jonathan in that moment knew that there's something that's stirring inside of a nation. That not only did his armor bearer need him, and not only did his father need him, but an entire nation needed him. And that if he would, would go forward with all faith and courage, maybe an entire nation could be flipped on its head. And he said, I know that God is here. I know that God is with me. And I just believe with every ounce of me that if we act, God will act. And then, and then when God acts, others will act. And then in that, there's this activity that changes the world. And I wonder for you today, and the band can come up as I close. I wonder for you today, what is the action that God has been waiting for you to step into? What's the thing in your life, that, that voice that you've been silencing, right? We don't, we don't like to admit this, right? But what's that, that voice, that thing that God's been saying to you that, you that you know he's been saying to you, but you're acting like you have, you're not hearing it? Anybody else like that, right? Where, where you know God's saying this, but then you're like, oh, like, oh, God, did you really mean that? 
Wait, you put your earphones in? No, God, I can't hear you. I'm listening to my iPod. It's 2017. Nobody has iPods. I'm listening to my iPhone. Like, I know for me, there's so many things in my life where, where God has spoken and he said it. Where, where God has, has told me that you know what to do. And, I, and I've just silenced that voice because it required too much of me. Where I acted like I couldn't hear it because I knew what I would have to do. And I, I've had those moments in my life when, when, I, when I just got done with it. I got, I got done with living a life when I knew I was settling for less when God wanted me to do so much more. Man, I just had to with all humility and embarrassment just say, God, I surrender it all. God, I, I'm done. I'm done sitting under that pomegranate tree acting like I'm actually making a difference with my life. I'm tired of, of telling the story that I'm living the life that I was created to live when I know that there's so much more. And I wonder for you, what could happen? What could happen in your life? What could happen in, in this church? If, if you stop silencing that voice and you turn the volume up and you say, God, I need you to speak. I need you to say whatever needs to be said. And that whatever it is, God, I will act and I will move because I know it will make me better and it will make the world around me better. And I just wonder how much life could happen if we do this together. 